Right, good evening ladies and gentlemen, and really great to see so many of you here tonight, and a very warm welcome and an appreciation on behalf of the Back of the Alliance Memorial Charity, really great to see so many of you here, and welcome to the second of our series of lectures running up to the commemorations uh, at the end of May. And before I go on to today's uh, lecture, I just want to draw your attention uh, to this slide that's up there, which uh, lays out some of the things that are happening over that weekend on the 26th uh, to the 28th of May. Uh, a few key events over there, but the key one I want to pass out there is the Sunday event. There is going to be a drumhead service which everybody's invited to, and that will be down on the pier head, and there will be a march uh, of uh, certain people coming into that as well, so you're all invited to that. And uh, the Sunday evening close, hopefully, uh, with the uh, parade of a convoy sailing up the Mersey. Uh, that evening, depending on weather and tide. Uh, in my day job, I'm also the Harbour Master for the Mersey, and I'm an awkward bugger, so we'll see what happens on that. But uh, I draw your attention to that. Please make the most of it, because it promises to be a fantastic weekend. We've got probably got about five <coughs> warships uh, coming from different nations. Uh, we've arranged for a Swordfish, Seafire, Lancaster, Hurricane, Spitfire coming along as well, along with many other uh, things in the military and civilian uh, village down on the pier, on the pier head. So you're all welcome. Right, turning back to uh, obviously the lecture uh, this evening. Whilst the uh, the battle raged above uh, the uh, uh, deep below, another war was being waged that of the information war, which today, of course, we're all familiar with, with these and what have you, and the reliance on the miles of undersea cables. We are fortunate to have with us tonight the perfect person to bring this to life for us. Stephen Jones, a former seafarer, he comes from a long line of Mersey-based mariners with links to the Battle of the Atlantic. He served with cable and wireless, laying repairing submarine cables the world over, and also uh, lays claim to having laid the first dedicated internet cable between the UK and the US. Today he works with Seafarers Welfare and Maritime Security. He qualified as a Chief Officer, he holds a BSc Honours in Maritime Studies, an MSc in Communication, and an MA in International Relations. He is an Associate Fellow of the Nautical Institute and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and a proprietor of the Athenaeum. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome our speaker tonight, Stephen Jones. Thank you very much. Uh, 
could all tell Oasis are reforming. I feel like Liam Gallagher with the mic up here like this. But uh, great to see you all and thank you so much for coming. Um, as Gary has said, there's so much going on around the Atlantic commemorations and it's great that Liverpool has stepped up once more to be a focal point of remembering the sacrifices that were made by so many and of course so many merchant seafarers who were simply going about their jobs so the fact that we're able to always bring back the memory of those seafarers who gave so much is such an important part of why we commemorate what is going on. Those of you who came to the first of the lectures, what we kind of wanted to do was to not just look at what happened in the Battle of the Atlantic, it's well known, it's well documented, we all know these things, although there's lots of interesting things that we can still kind of learn from it. And that's what we wanted to do, we wanted to go deeper into the stories to see what impact it's had on us, not just as an enabler to allow us to win the war, but what legacy did victory in the war that was actually built on the foundations of the Battle Atlantic actually deliver for us? Last time out we heard about the kind of the, the geopolitical tensions and how understanding your enemy is key. This time, taking perhaps the thread of going deeper a little too literally, I'm talking about subsea cables and the fact that this was such an important, but perhaps sometimes ignored or forgotten part of the, the, the war that was waged. So as we said, I, I was a, a seafarer with Cable and Wireless. I spent many years laying and repairing subsea cables all over the world. Ended up being tra senior training manager as we handed ships over to the Chinese, which will be another bit of the story as we move through, looking at the implications of where we are now as a nation and what our legacy from the Battle of the Atlantic brings to us. So as we can see there, communications in wartime is, is a hugely important topic. And basically, I think the talk can be split into two. It'll be the first bit, if I was to ask how communications were managed, you'd probably say radio. And in the second part, when I ask how communications are kind of managed, you'll probably think about satellites. But it's not. It's all about cables. It has been for a very long time, and it will be for a very long time to come. There we are, Britain, the centre of the world. This was really the kind of the, the premise, the power that Britain had before the First World War, coming out of the First World War, into the Second. This was the position that we had with Empire. These lines of communication spanning the globe, which meant that so much power, literally and metaphorically, came through Britain. And we were very much at the centre of this world, and it was cable and wireless who actually kept it all going and working. Very quick little bit of history for those who don't know that much about cables. Britain was always the leader in this, from the very first kind of instances that we look to the idea of connecting empire. We looked over to the Atlantic and we wanted to connect to the States. So we had the first commercial telegraph companies, and, and we laid the first cables. Interestingly, one of the first attempts was actually at the channel between Dover and Calais, and the French fishermen got extremely excited because they'd found gold seaweed at one point and recovered, rather annoyingly, all the cable and were <laughs> <laughs> surprised to find that it was actually copper, not gold, and it wasn't um, seaweed at all. So, so Britain had always been at the forefront of this. And, and interestingly, as per usual, Liverpool again pops up in all the stories, in all the history, in everything that was done. It's Liverpool that again was front and centre of this. And the British Irish Magnetic Telegraph Company was basically funded ultimately by what was a Manchester cotton merchant, John Pender, um, who looked, saw the future, maybe it wasn't so much cotton and maybe it was communications instead. So he put a lot of his fortune into cables. The investment, of course, even back then, was immense. Probably because it was a bit of a leap into the dark in many ways, you know, would it work, could it work? And the Great Eastern, the largest ship of its time, 211 feet long, not that much shorter than the Titanic even, was the ship that was chosen really to be the first 
successful cable ship. It had the size to be able to load the cable and it had the power to get the job done. So all in all, they got the cables going and then ultimately, as we saw in that first slide, this was the red line that connected Empire, Britain, to the rest of the world. Jumping forward, the First World War was really what they termed the Cable War, and that was because Germany actually had quite a lot of cables at that point. The fact that it lost the First World War, the fact that it had a lot of its borders kind of reduced and, and really its worldview changed. It didn't really have that many cables by the Second World War. It only had two international cables. But what we saw is that the Telegraph War was still hugely important. It was Britain again at the key to this. Radio, naturally, you would think was the communication medium, but actually, no, very imperfect for the mechanisms that they wanted to project. You can intercept radio very easily, of course. You can see, monitor where traffic movements are, going to, are heavier because there's a lot more radio traffic. So you still needed that link directly to who you wanted to communicate with. So that was really the role of telegraph. So hugely important military and intelligence use. And as you can see there, by 1945, by the end of the war, something like 63 million messages were being sent. These are the kind of figures that we're starting to even equate into our modern communications age. But it wasn't just about military use. It wasn't just about the strategic intelligence value of it. There was other life to be kept going. There was morale, which was hugely important. So I'll show you some interesting adverts in a minute from Cable and Wireless. So it was very much about keeping morale high, keeping people motivated, keeping them feeling part of a winning side through war. But also trade and investment. Money is hugely important in war, almost as important as anything else. The ones with the most money tend to win. And telegraphs were hugely influential in the markets. So where you wanted investment, where you wanted to keep cash flowing, that's where telegraph cables were hugely important and influential because the markets were vital for that capital war effort to be able to build the ships, the planes, to feed the armies that went on ultimately to victory. I found some of these old adverts, I don't know whether you can see them terribly well there, but, but they speak of that age of what cable and wireless was such an important part of doing. They were there when the, the Canadian troops were overseas getting their medals people back home could understand and find out what was going on. It kept Britain at the heart of everything that was going on, the decision making, and also their messages of love, of support, of keeping people connected through a most traumatic time. So Cable and Wireless was absolutely pivotal to all of this. But interestingly as well, it was a business, and it remained a business all the way through the war. So they did this as well, and they made money, and they made money to be able to afford to go and look after the things that were so important to the war effort. It was a big deal. Cable and wireless mattered to the world. It drew all nations together, shrinking the world in what was obviously a difficult place and time. So throughout the war, there was lots to be considered. There was a strategic demands of war, of being there to have the communications that you needed, but equally, how do you do that? How do you make people able to deal with things? How do you disrupt the enemy? And how do you provide your own allies with what they need? And what we saw was, initially, as soon as war started, Cable and Wireless were straight out of the traps. And on the first day of war, they managed to cut the German cables, two cables, straight through, which obviously is quite useful and, and actually sends a really strong signal, a two-fingered salute, if you will, to the enemy. That it doesn't matter what you do, we can come along and we can disrupt, we can destroy your communications literally in an afternoon. And that's what they did. More connected was Italy, and when Italy came into the war, instantly, again, came on wireless ships out there cutting their cables as well. So, and not just that, we actually recovered the cable as well and used it for different purposes, so waste not, want not. The war on waste, as it were. So this is what we were able to do. So from the absolute start of it, cable ships were fully integrated into the war effort. And there's just as a 
quick illustration if you're wondering how you cut cables it's all about having the right kit to do the job now you might assume that it's divers or submarines or ROVs in this day and age and to some extent it is and can be but actually a lot of it is about dragging some of these things along the seabed knowing where someone left their cable and you hook it on and you cut it and then it's job done so it, it can be in some ways quite a basic crude kind of um, operation and this was an interesting one so one of the german cables that they cut which was the emden to azores they actually cut it but buoyed off both ends and repurposed it for d-day so they had this cable ready to go into mainland europe ready for invasion so even in the earliest days they were still thinking and considering how do we remain connected when we want to be not when the enemy wants to be so we come to the cable ships the cable ships in peacetime telegraphs as we said hugely important hugely influential part of life even as far back then so in their day-to-day -day life in peacetime the cable ships existed to look after the cables they would lay them when demand suggested that it was necessary and equally they would go along when all these normal run-of-the-mill problems exist and damage cable they would go out and would pick it up they would stick it back together put it in the sea and everyone was reconnected again and life went on like that but obviously in war everything changes as we know and the cable ships were out there and i thought this was a really powerful quote from the chairman of cable miles at the time and official he said in fair weather and foul peaceful waters all you both invested the cable fleet sailed with the job of keeping the free world connected and you know and if you take anything away from this it's the role of cable ships in keeping the world connected and i think that's such an important thing as we look further ahead into the future even in the latter part of the um, presentation thinking about how we actually get all the data shifted that we need around the world so this is what they were doing these cable ships were out there repairing, laying, diverting the cables, a constant strategic overview of where the cables were, where the attacks were, what was happening, and basically being able to respond extremely quickly to any cuts. The Germans did start trying to cut our cables, but they basically found that it wasn't worth it because the time it took them and the risks that they went through to cut the cables, cable and wireless ships would be out there and have them repaired certainly in a day or so so there was no point really it was just a waste of effort so this is what they did these ships were out there little ships doing very big jobs and it certainly didn't come without its risks there was problems a cable ship out doing its job if you're laying cable you'll be lucky to be doing five six knots but you're tethered literally to something so it's very difficult to maneuver you basically are sitting duck and if you're holding on to cable to repair it then you are just sat waiting for the jointers to get the repairs done get the cable away and then scurry back so of course losses were almost inevitable and, and there were many losses bombed torpedoed and, and chased away at various points so lots of challenges for the cable and wireless crews again remembering what we said before about merchant seafarers just going about their jobs that's what these cable men were and it was men um, that's what they were they were seafarers going about their jobs and i just thought it'd be interesting to show you some of the pictures of the ships that did these amazing things and it's uh, kind of humphrey brogart in africa type jobs really they're very kind of luxury yacht come cable ships so these basically they, they they were old ships even at the time they've been kind of you know 20 30 40 years old at the time doing these things and, and I'll, I'll talk a little in about the kind of technicalities of their design and what they had but basically slow moving and obvious targets but there they were this was the fleet of ships with a few more besides but these were the ones that really kept the world connected through the entire war and just for those who are <coughs> these type of things in case there's any marine engineers in the room um th that's the kind of basic notional layout of a cable ship in of that kind of era big tanks there that you coiled the cable into you will be laying it out of the stern so they have what's called a cable engine that pulls the cable out 
and then you, you, you kind of lay it behind you. And because they didn't have much power, and they certainly didn't have thrusters, and they didn't have any of the kind of sophisticated controls that we have now, basically they would hold the cables on the bow when they were repairing them. So you'd bring in the ends of cable, and you'd be able to kind of position the ship into the tide, current, or wind, and be using that as something to kind of steam against to try and hold the ship into position. So not, not sophisticated, probably not even that far removed from the way that the Great Eastern was doing it. But that was, again, you know, the design that, that, that was so successful. It wasn't just about the ships, though. Cable Wireless had people all over the world. It was very much part of empire. It was our representatives overseas working our communications and also in strange places at times that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Places like Ascension, for instance, where the cable station manager was almost a de facto king. There's so few people that lived there, it's pretty much only cable and wireless staff. But all of a sudden, they found that they were the epicenter of an enormous event themselves. For instance, Ascension, probably not that important before the war, but suddenly with all the Mediterranean cables cut, everything was coming through ascension in the cables so all of a sudden their job changed and was magnified and the risks too um, they were also very much engaged in kind of monitoring as best they could u-boat movements there was lots of triangulation done when u-boats were spotted there were things called u-boat cables laid at various points where they would be able to kind of measure the magnetic interference from U-boats passing over cables. So they were monitoring all these things. So in a, in a strange way, it was almost like a kind of communications special force, really. But they were also involved, because they were so integrated into society in different places, the likes of Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay. So when the Graf Spey lived into Montevideo, it was the Cayman Wireless people that were on hand to try and lobby the Uruguayans through all the cables that they were receiving to get the Graf Spey to be sent out far sooner than the, the um, Uruguayans perhaps were going to under pressure from the Germans. So they took on this incredibly important diplomatic role as well as the communications. Um, the Azores was an interesting one. Uh, initially, the Portuguese were only allowing uh, German U-boats in. There wasn't any UK allied interest in the Azores, and again, apart from the Cayman Wireless, and it was those people that pressured and allowed the contacts and, and the kind of mechanisms of dialogue to open, to allow us to be able to use the Azores, which I think had a massive impact on closing a lot of the gaps of protection that we perhaps had at that time for the merchant convoys. So, so very much Cayman Wireless, again, at the heart of so much that was going on, but perhaps not really recognised certainly not protected by the Geneva Convention, which was a massive concern. The fact that you had these citizens that were out there that were going about their job, that were in difficult situations. So what it was decided was really to create a bit of a kind of faux military role for them, to create these telecom units, to bring them in basically under the kind of banner of military so that if they were captured, if they did get themselves into trouble, then at least then they would be treated as prisoner of war rather than anything else that you wouldn't want. But they were involved in all kinds of things. There were stories of where cables were cut in, in harbours, that the cable and wireless staff would be out there getting tugs and trying to fix the cables themselves. So very much a kind of resourceful, keep the signals going at all cost. And that's really what was such a key important role in victory that communications were kept. The Emden Azores German cable repurposed. So all of a sudden we instantly had communications coming out of Cherbourg after D Day. So again, a cable and wireless um, effort that did so much. And you can see there that the sheer volume of traffic that was starting to go up, driven by war, 205% increase. And these people kept this going constantly. And it was a huge effort. And, and again, I think a quote there from Edward Wishall that kind of sums it up and how success was won is with that spirit of adventure and free enterprise that even in the darkest days, Cable and Wireless personnel persevered, they pushed through and they got so much done and achieved. 
Now what's happened, as we all know, Britain probably isn't the centre of the world anymore, so somewhere along the line, things kind of change. And what's happened, rather interestingly, is that when America decided to come into the war, they had some kind of quite strict terms to us, the Allies, that they would come in under. And it's something that kind of doesn't often get talked about and I think maybe overlooked a little. But America was quite isolationist in those times, didn't really have that much call for subsea cables. The telegraphs that were coming into it kind of managed the traffic that it needed, it was connected to where it wanted. But there was always a desire to get in to the world market, to go beyond that. And that was one of the demands that they had, that they wanted to be granted access and the ability to, to lay their own submarine cables, access to the Empire wireless systems, to be able to base their own stations in what had been Empire outposts. And basically, they wanted to break the British stranglehold. So without even firing a shot, the Americans coming into the war probably had their biggest victory on day one because the peace suddenly became more about America's future in the world than perhaps our own. And in one of the flurries, and I was reading some of the correspondence between Cable and Wireless and the British government and, and all that's going on, and they actually forgot to tell Cable and Wireless at that point that the Americans had been granted all this access to what had hitherto been Cable and Wireless controlled territory. And it, and it caused, as you might imagine, quite a stink amongst them. But being wartime, thankfully it kind of settled down. But that really was one of the big changing points because as soon as the war was over, Britain not only kind of divested of the, the jewels of empire, but also the control of the communications globally as well. So it was a really important part of it. And when we talk of the peace that was to come after war, and I've actually got a, a copy of the poster which is at the back, so after you finish here and having a drink or whatever, do, do take a look because it's quite fascinating that the, the Atlantic Charter, which was really in the earliest days of the US coming into war, this was about the peace that they saw from it. This was the reason why everyone was going to war, not just to defeat evil, great idea though that is, but really to build something better beyond that. And I've always been quite surprised that although the focus is so much on trade, and obviously, you know, with other hats on, there's a, there's a lot of us here that were at sea or working in the maritime industry, and we constantly focus on how important seafarers are, how important shipping is, not just to the UK, but to the world. And you can see that that's so much what victory in the Second World War was about. It was about the freedoms of trade. It was about ships carrying all kinds of goods globally and being the kind of the modern world really that, that we've kind of developed into. But there's no mention of cables or telegraph on there. I don't know whether that was deliberate or not. So that brings us up to today and really as I said at the start that the, the premise of these lectures hasn't just been to talk about the past, hasn't just been to talk about the Second World War or the Battle of the Atlantic, but what the legacy of that has given us, what that's translated to in this world today. And again, it's all about connectivity, it's all about data, it's all about information. And the modern world simply could not exist without these fiber optic cables now, not the gold seaweed, fiber optic cables that span the world and carry such a vast amount of data with it. I, I, I've talked a few times at various events, whatever, and people, of course, assume that satellites are the thing that takes so much of the data, but they just don't. Something like 97% of the world's data travels through subsea cables. So it, it, it's vital strategically that we're in this mix still and there are barriers to this other nations threaten our cables other nations threaten control of laying and repairing so there we are so that's just a snapshot of really where we're at today when it comes to cables you know and demand doubles about every two years the actual hunger for data constantly you know all of a sudden it's netflix this it's it's 
it's the demands are immense. And you can see that the speeds of some of these cables are capable of 30,000 4K movies every second down the pipes, under the sea, all this data flowing so quickly, seamlessly. And, and, and now there's huge investments by the likes of Google, Meta, and Amazon to put cables in because there's a stark illustration of what this means, what the modern world of fiber optics actually means to us. The change that we've come in such a relatively short space of time to taking a month to find out that America was independent through to having instantaneous news about the president, former president not being so independent. There's so much to consider. Rapid expansion of the world. And there's some little snapshots there for you to give you a kind of sense of just how much stuff is going on and under the sea and these constant projects that new cables are coming on stream all the time because there's such an insatiable demand not only to be connected and it used to be the cables would run between the big population centers because that's where the demand was now we're changing to, to a new model where it's where the data centers are so it's actually you're getting a whole new generation of cables that actually connect data centers and then the data centers connect to the population but then we get into this strange kind of quandary of, well, who's protecting these cables? The world is so reliant on them. They're absolutely pivotal to everything we do, but they fall into a lot of strange middle grounds on who's protecting them, who owns them, whose are they, and what happens if things go wrong. In, notionally, they're, they're covered under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, you're not really meant to go fiddling with them, but if you do, then you will get yourself into trouble. But unfortunately, there's no real mechanism to enforce that. The assumption within those laws is that it will probably be by accident if you cut a cable or if you damaged it. It doesn't really take account of malicious actors setting out to actually cut the cables. So you've got these huge problems that potentially you can be blacking entire nation's internet out if you cut them. And this has happened in a few various places, quite high profile, Egypt was cut off for a few days and, and the impact on their financial system was absolutely immense. Uh, I understand that Taiwan, some of the islands north of Taiwan, they've had their cable perhaps accidentally cut 27 times in the past couple of years. So uh, I'm sure there won't be anyone uh, bothering but the, you know, the government of the UK recognises that this is a really important issue. This is a problem. This needs to be thought about. A couple of years ago, writing for a think tank, our now Prime Minister wrote about this. You know, the kind of strange anachronism that in this age we're so reliant on these plastic pipes underneath the sea with all our data, perhaps with our fuel as well. But the ability to use them is absolutely fundamental to everything we do. So. The threat is absolutely existential if we don't manage and look after the cables or find the mechanisms to do that. Because this is what it's all about, keeping the lights on, keeping the heat on, keeping everyone connected, and okay, maybe not TikTok, but there are things that are important to many people and society rests on them. So there has been a move, and a very kind of rapid move, from the UK to try to heal some of the gaps in capability that have been there. So two new ships coming into the RFA, um, which will basically have a little bit of a strange role, but one of the roles will be to monitor cables, to be able to kind of respond to the threats to them, to, to be able to monitor them and, uh, I don't know, maybe fix them? I don't know, I wouldn't fancy their chances, but let's, let's fingers crossed that they will do that. You know, you've probably heard a lot of the fuss about the Nord Stream pipeline being blown up and the impact on gas. Well, you know, so everything that's under the sea can be so easily sabotaged and damaged. And we do need the capability to know what's going on and at least project that we care about it. But there's a massive shortage of cable ships. We seem to have got to a funny point when I, when I looked at those early cable ships around the start of the war, most of them were 30, 40 years old. And all of a sudden, miraculously, we're at exactly that same point again. Most of the cable ships 
the big ones certainly, are getting to this kind of age now. They're quite long in the tooth. But it's very difficult to get a cable ship. There are long waiting lists and the cost of doing it are immense, as you can see there. You know, running into 100 million to, to buy one, probably more now, and with huge annual running costs for something that is, in essence, meant to be kind of free. The internet's free. We don't like paying for it. We probably, you know, begrudge our, our, our sky bills or whatever to, to pay for it. But the, the costs of actually installing, of repairing and keeping cables working is immense. So if you do sabotage it, if you do see it as your aim to get amongst it and to damage, then you know you, you can kind of occupy a lot of problems for people. Um, some of you might have been wanting to shout out, what happened to cable and wireless? We don't really hear of cable and wireless anymore. And unfortunately, no, we don't. You know, going from such an important, pivotal part of the nation's psyche, being so associated with empire, being really, you know, such a vital part of what it was really to be British and have those red lines running around the sea. They kind of flew a little bit close to the sun, really, some bad investments, some perhaps, you know, betting on red and it came up black type thing with cable capacity, buying ships maybe when they shouldn't. Some of you might remember Mercury Communications a few years back that they kind of put a lot of money into. Uh, Mercury Communications also sponsored Everton at some point, and I'm sure the demise has got nothing to do with that, but just saying. Um, the fleet that cable and wireless became is now Global Marine. Global Marine still exists. Global Marine has these six cable ships. So the Glide spotted that there were 60 cable ships, give or take, in the world. So we still have 10 uh, percent of the world's cable ship capacity, you know, very much UK run, managed, operated, and with those skills and capabilities that we have. Um, ships that have laid a lot of cables, ships that have repaired a lot of cables, an incredible amount, oh, that's a cable working, um, an incredible amount of expertise and skill still in the UK. But I worry where it's going to come from next and where these go. When this turns into three ships, to two ships, to one ship, where are we going with it? Because things are changing constantly, quickly. China is becoming a superpower in every sense, but in cable manufacture and installation and ownership as well. And I think, you know, if we're trying to really understand where the threats lie, it is about losing control of the cable network. It is about reliance on other people's expertise and skills and ultimately their fleet. When I was working with Cable and Wireless, they were a little bit ahead of the game, but perhaps ahead of the wrong game, in that they actually gifted China a cable ship. Um, and I was one of the training managers sent out to Shanghai to try and kind of assimilate a Chinese crew onto cable ships. Um, so they've soaked up so much expertise, they've soaked up so much of our know-how on what the ships do, how they do it, and, and the ways in which they themselves could then turn that to their advantage. The bottom point there about laying cables on behalf of small Pacific Islands may seem an odd one, but it's really important. You might have kind of read in the news about China's kind of approach to debt trap diplomacy, where they, they kind of encourage a nation to have a, a super highway or a, a mega port built or a new airport, but then lo and behold, the demand doesn't come, but they still have to service immense debts, and then lo and behold, they default, and it all becomes the ownership of the Chinese government. And that is very much what is happening, I believe, when it comes to cables. So they're encouraging these island states, perhaps to have data centers, because remember I said it's a move not so much about population now, but data. So the data centers can be built on Nehru or somewhere in the Pacific, and then they're convincing financial arguments, then you can build this, and then we'll pay for this, and we'll give you this, and then all of a sudden it doesn't really work out, and lo and behold, the cables are owned by another nation. And that really is the problem of our future. Not many cable ships, not many being built, but there was one built last week in China and has just now been delivered. And, and this is really the position that we find ourselves in. You know, what happens in the future? 
So coming back to that issue of the practicalities of cables, what do you think is better? Are we better to be cutting cables like we did in the Second World War, or is it better to be able to control them? Or do we leave them in place and we just use them to quietly cyberjack our enemies in the future? What would a future battle of the Atlantic look like when it comes to data? And I think it's something that we all perhaps need to, to think about, be aware of, but hopefully apply the lessons, the energy, the passion, the bravery that people in the past that fought the original battle of the Atlantic did for us. And remembering that seafarers are so pivotal to everything we do, everything we rely on, not just the food, not just the seats, not just the fuel, but equally the data that you have as well. If it wasn't for seafarers, we wouldn't have that excess either. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. I wondered uh, when you lay a cable over huge distances, um, how do you transmit that information and then keep the, the actual information, keep it transmitting over three, four thousand miles and more? Yeah, one of the problems with the original telegraph was, or one of the advantages, sorry, is that the, the, the power could get through to the other end. When it came to telephony and, and data, it always had a kind of, it would run out of steam, basically. So every 123 kilometers, give or take, actually have what's called repeaters. So they're amplifiers that are built in to the system. So you, you load the cable, and just in case anyone asks what cable on the ship looked like, I prepared this one. Um, basically, you load that into the tanks on the ship, and at various points it would loop out to somewhere on the ship where you'd have these amplifiers, these repeaters, and then you, you kind of put them out as well. So you basically just pay it out, and every 100 or so kilometers there's this amplification boost that comes in. Does, does that still affect fiber optical cable, though? Yeah, yeah, the, the fiber optics still need that boost of energy to get it through the, those distances. So you have the same repeaters now, um, and they're hugely expensive, like a million odd dollars each. So that you know the, the money to run the cables is immense. And and whereas the cables tend to be quite robust, it's the amplifiers, the repeaters that usually are the susceptible point, and oftentimes it's wildlife. So you you kind of. Because there's a kind of vague electric hum around the whole system, it attracts the likes of sharks and conger eels tend to like it. A lot of ships, they'd be sent out to repair a cable, bring it on board, and the poor old cable people would get a hell of a shock as would a conger eel emerge <laughs> that have been happily living in there for a couple of months, but it just bitten through the one bit. So, uh, so yeah, so there, there are some acceptable points. Uh, Ian? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Uh, that it's not a case of if cables, the most important cables are going to be cut, but when. So what is being put in place from when it happens? What, what countermeasures do you think are being planned for? I mean, basically, what the, the biggest kind of, it's almost like a game of 3D chess. What you're trying to do is have resilience built into the system. So you wouldn't want one cable that goes from the UK to the states and then if it gets cut then that's your lot you're always considering the kind of loops in the system so the minute that one got cut where does that traffic kind of route round so it's always about trying to be one step ahead of the kind of you know the, the damage I guess a bit like being a plumber you're always thinking where the water flows and it's a little bit like that where the information is going to get to where you want it so that's really kind of from a cable management perspective from the kind of more military or strategic then you know i guess the, the new ships will hopefully allow us to perhaps stay one step ahead of the threats do, do cables have any effect on the ecosystem on the environment um there is talk of green cables now um because I, everything that you put anywhere has some effect and you know there are they're, they're wrapped in 
tar and all the rest of it. So there is some, but I, I mean, it's very minimal. I mean, you, you're talking about something the size of a hose pipe going across <laughs> an ocean, you know, the, the, the physical dimensions of the impact are very small, but that's not to say that they're not there. So the, there is the kind of new rethinking about how these cables can be constructed differently. So basically what we've got there is on, on the far side in just a kind of white sheet, that's how a cable would look in very deep water. Basically you're not expecting damage, you're not expecting it really to be get, getting any kind of you know, rubbing or interaction with anything. So you make it as light and easy to get out as you can. As you move into the shore and into the continental shelf, and certainly as you're coming closer into its landing point where you're probably gonna be over rocks or whatever, then increasingly you build up the protection that the cable has. So ultimately, when you're coming into double armor and rock armor, you're talking things that are very, very heavy, and the actual kind of carrying of them around the ship to even get them out is, is become quite a challenge. And um, how do you deal with the extreme contours of the seabed? And could you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Um, how do you deal with the extreme contours of the seabed? Um, it's a really good question because basically, you know, there's mountains, valley deep, valley, uh, mountain deep, valley high across the seabed, and if you follow the contours exactly, you're wasting an awful lot of cable because actually you don't need to follow. So what you do is you work out the kind of the angle that you're happy for it to kind of rest between two points. So there's quite a few cables that go across the Marianas Trench, for instance. Now you wouldn't have poured 10 kilometers of cable in to come up the other side. So it's all about kind of just finding that nice catenary, they call it, that you're resting it on. You don't want it to be chafing too much, but equally it has to sit fairly taut where it is. Where are these, the majority of these cables manufactured? Um, it's tended to be all over, really. A lot of big manufacturers, uh, names such as Alcatel, Siemens, um, a few others, Pirelli were a big cable manufacturer. They would tend to have manufacturing places all over the world. Um, Portland had a big manufacturing place in the UK. Calais was one, Sydney. Uh, Port Botany has a big cable farm um, manufacturing. Uh, New Hampshire in the States has a big one. There's one in Yokohama on the west coast of the States as well. They're, they're, they're kind of dotted all over, really. And, and basically, a cable ship will go into the factory, kind of whether well, it depends on what's old or new one, or you go bow first or stern first, and basically hook on, and then they feed it into those tanks and you'd be probably in there for a couple of weeks while they pull the cable out of the tank. Sometimes they haven't even finished building the cable while you're there as a ship being loaded and you're just trying to keep pace with each other. So, yeah, so the, um, it depends whether you see it as an entry point or an exit point from the UK. Do we treat those exit points and entry points as critical national infrastructure? Um, I, I think some are. I don't think all are, but some of them are just a manhole with cable and wireless written on them. So there's, there's some places where I think cables just come in, because a lot of the cables are owned by private entities that don't really have any interaction with the wider populace. It's just a private cable, no different really to the cables underneath the road, for instance, but there are obviously some that will be more kind of protected than others. So, which cable company's shares should we buy? <laughs> uh, which cable company's shares should you buy? Well, I actually got my dividend for what's left of my cable and wireless shares today, and I tell you, not them. Um, well, I th think... Or cable shipping company's yeah, shares. I mean, you know, the, the, the Chinese company Chinese. seems to be quite busy. <laughs> and that's usually a good sign of some things. Um, traditionally, the cable ships have been a funny business. It's not, I wouldn't put my money necessarily there. In no, okay. horses, it's a grand national. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's behind the bar. Yeah. <laughs> when you have a cable that stretches 3,000 miles across the ocean, sometimes the size of a hose pipe, yeah. and it's damaged or sabotaged or broken, how do they find where that damage is? 
Um, I don't know if you heard the question, but basically when a cable is damaged, how do you locate where it is on the cable that's actually damaged? Because you know you, you set out from Portland or over in the States, told to go and repair this cable, you're not gonna go and plan. So basically, because it's a, an electric signal between both ends, they can work out and, and pinpoint basically where the signal is lost. So pretty accurately, really, you're gonna know where the, where the break or the damage is and the cable ship is dispatched, sent out there. What they tend to do is they have maintenance agreements. So companies or governments have a cable, and it's a huge investment, but what they will also sign up to is an ongoing maintenance contract. So Cable and Wireless we used to have um, ships based around the globe, so Bermuda, Fiji, Vancouver, Philippines, uh, Singapore, all just waiting on 20 hour, 24 hours notice to be able to be ready to go out and repair the cable. How's a, how's a uh, cable uh, fixed when it is cut? What do they actually do to make it watertight? And, you know, yeah, so, so basically, so you, you, you find out that there's probably easier a, a, a damaged cable. So you, you know where the damage is roughly. So you go in and you'll probably grapple for it. So instead of cutting it, you still put a hook down if it's in appropriate water or maybe an ROV. But you basically, you bring up one bit of the cable and then you'll cut it and buoy it off. Then you'll go and get the other bit of cable and bring that on. And you're basically bringing them both into the ship, both ends, mm -hmm. cut out the bad bit. It goes into what they call the kind of jointing center. And the cable engineers within that, on fiber optics, it's obviously more complex than just welding um, copper together. So basically they have, x-ray machines and they line up the glass fibers within the optics and they're able to kind of see and fuse them together perfectly so basically when you're an officer on the ship and you're you're sat there waiting most of the time you're waiting for them to be able to bring these pieces of fiber together perfectly to be able to fuse them and then test the fusion and the minute that you get the green light but that's fine then they will be putting whatever protection that it needed possibly a bit more because it's damaged so probably wasn't working great and then you just bring it out and you'll slowly pay it back out of the ship drop it in the water and hope you don't see it for another 25 years <laughs> and would you put an amplifier in at that point as well um, because it's a weak section no it shouldn't be weak it should be exactly should the same if you get the if your jointers get the fusion yeah, correct, then it's the same as it was yeah. before it went in. So no, you wouldn't because then that would probably monkey with the signal between the existing two amplifiers. You wouldn't be wanting to boost the signal to be boosted again. So, so probably not. Uh, someone down the front. Yeah, from a security point of view, you spoke about some of these cables getting severed. Have there been any instances where they've been compromised? Or is the encryption too great to have other people to break into them? Yeah, I mean, that there have been stories that certain governments have the capability to certainly listen to cables by putting pieces of kit close in to them and being able to kind of harvest the data. Probably the same data that the sharks get a tickly nose from, so they can kind of still get that sense of something, but I don't really know the details of that. Picking up on your point about the existential threat if we lose data channels uh, and the resilience that we build into the system. Uh, if you were working for somebody not very nice, where would you head for with your bolt cutters? <laughs> um, well, as with anything in life, do it in the most awkward place. So the deeper, the further away from everyone, then that would kind of, it's going to take more time, even if nothing else to get the repair out to it. The fact is it will be repaired within a couple of days, probably, so whenever, you know, so basically, if you were trying to send someone, you, it's kind of that balancing act between physically, how deep you can go and damage the cable, and how far off the coast you can go and do that, versus how far, how long the ship will take to come back and fix it. Arguably, the more cuts you put in, the more demands on the cable ships, so you're almost kind of, you know, being ahead of the repairs. Yep. Stephen, is this a potential 
plot for the next James Bond movie? And are you a contender for the lead role? I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, one, we'll just have two more, so one more. So, fault finding and fixing sounds uh, challenging at best of times. How was that achieved during wartime? Um, it, it was done in the same way, basically, that the telegraph centre, so the cable wireless cable centre, would notice a drop down in the voltage, and they would be able to know how far it had dropped and be able to do the mathematics to work out where it was. So there was no kind of more or less complex. A, a cut in cable is a cut in cable regardless, really. It was just the poor sods on the ship then that had to go and dodge the bombs and the torpedoes to actually fix it. Uh, I think last question. Yeah, uh, given that China and Russia are land-based continents, are they as dependent on these things as, say, NATO, which is huge oceans between the Allies? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the data demands in China have been vast, and I think part of its kind of social fabric that it's created for itself as it's come out of communism has really been driven in some part by the, the, the access, albeit very controlled, to the outside world. So they're, they're, they, they have lots of cables going in. I think kind of getting Hong Kong was a kind of turning point in their rationale on, on cables coming in. So there was obviously a lot of cables into Hong Kong and I think that they saw the advantages of, of that versus perhaps the risks that they have. But they, they have a lot of cable capacity, so they must be enjoying some aspects of it. Um, just what, one more. Just one more. You know if it's two mile down and there's a break, yeah. so how do you get the two ends to the top? Because there's no slack in that cable, I would imagine. Because as you're laying that cable, you're laying it to the, to the seabed. Yeah. So there's a cut, so you've got to bring one end two mile up and the other end two mile up to make a, a joint. Well, if you've ever tried to that. kind of um, use a flymo on a long garden, you, you put an extension yeah. in. So you're making two joints. Yeah. You're not making, you're not making the joints. If, if you know the makeup of the cable and you know the slack that you've either got in it or not, yeah. then that would be what you do. And if, if you know it's at such a depth we're not going to be able to bring it up. Yes. Then what you do is you go and you grab one end and make off there. Yeah. So you cut it down yeah. and then bring it up yes. as far back as you have to go. You know, in relative terms, although two miles is very deep, it's not very far backwards. <laughs> so you know you're able to then just. No, but you're not laying this cable with any slack in it. Well, I mean, you're saying. constantly monitoring what the slack is, what it should be, and what you're willing to put back into the system. So it will be just recover it back, joint in, lay out, and then bring the other damaged end in, and then you're able to put it back where you found it. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Well, that's sort of whetted your appetite. Uh, I just want to advertise the next in the series of lectures, which is the...